بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته After the battle of Badr the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم had a number of military expeditions especially around the area of Medina because of the Bedouins and the tribes around them were encouraged to attack Medina thinking that the Muslims were weakened by the war and attempting to score a point with the tribe and the polytheist of Quraysh. Among the attacks that took place on Medina was an expedition by the name of Ghazwat al-Sawiq. And the sawiq is the flour that people make dough with and bake. Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who was the leader of the caravan which escaped Badr, he took a vow on himself not to have a total bath, not to shower at all until he invades Muhammad وسلم, and the Muslims, until he raids them. And this was a vow that lots of the warriors do, which means that they will not have any intimate relationship with their wives mm -hmm. until they do what they want to do. So in the middle of the night, he took in secret 200 riders and they rode to Medina at night and they hid so that no one would be aware of them. At first, he went to a leader, one leader of the Jews. His name was Huyay ibn Akhtab. And he knocked the door. But Huyay did not open the door for him. He did not want to break yeah, the, the treaties and the agreement. uh, agreements with the Prophet ﷺ. So he went to another Jew and his name was Salam ibn Mushkim. And this Jew opened his doors. He hosted Abu Sufyan. He gave him wine. He fed him. And he told him about everything Abu Sufyan needed to know about Medina. He gave him all the information needed. So this Jew did not honor the agreement with the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan sent a detachment to an area called Al-Arid or Urayyid and there he instructed his soldiers to burn to cut off the palm trees they were met by one of the Ansar and a companion of his they killed them both and they fled Medina the minute the Prophet Sallallahu knew about this he went after them and tried to catch them but they were fast riders they were on horses so they traveled very fast fleeing Medina abandoning everything and when they felt that they were too heavy to travel fast they threw the bags of flour that was with them and that is called a sawiq and that is why this battle is known to be the battle of a sawiq and the Prophet ﷺ, once he recognized and realized that he's unable to catch up with them, he went back and the companions collected these bags of flour and food and it was used by them. The second year of Hijrah was over. In the first month of the third year, the month of Muharram, the Prophet wasallam, his reconnaissance people came back to him informing him that the tribe of Thalaba and the tribe of Muharib are compiling an army to come and attack the outskirts of Medina. And there were also nomads and Bedouins. So the Prophet ﷺ prepared the biggest expedition, military expedition, before the Battle of Uhud. This was the biggest of all because it had 
450 warriors. He took this army and he went to the area of these tribes. The minute they saw Prophet ﷺ, as usual, escaped. they escaped and ran away and they went to the top of the mountains and the caves and they hid there. The Prophet ﷺ stayed one full month in their area. Only the whole month. month of Safar. He stayed there, camped, just to show the Arabs how strong and powerful they were. And the people could never come back to their place. place. Mm -hmm. It was reported that one of the polytheists, his name was Da'athur. As the first day or the second day, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were setting camp and it rained slightly. So the Prophet ﷺ was napping under one tree and his sword was hung next to him. Da'athur came and he drew the sword of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet woke up and he said, Muhammad, who protects you from me? Who's the man? So the Prophet said, والسلام, who protects me? Allah. And the guy trembled and the sword fell. So the Prophet took the sword from him. And he said, now, who protects you from me? The man said, you. And the Prophet والسلام, let him go. The man on the spot embraced Islam, went back to his people. And instead of uh, provoking them to hate the Prophet والسلام, he called them to Islam and they accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ used to have guards. And the companions used to guard him because they loved this. They have enjoyed guarding the Prophet ﷺ as they thought it was one of the greatest deeds they could offer. Until Allah revealed the verse of the Quran that Allah Almighty protects you from the people. So the Prophet looked at them and said, go away. I do not want any protection because Allah Azza wa Jal has given me his protection. And since then, nobody guarded the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. When they went to Medina, after the Battle of Badr, after these military expeditions, there was one prominent Jew who did not swallow this well. He did not like what he was hearing. And when they told him that the army of Muhammad وسلم, won in Badr and that the leaders of Quraysh died, he was in pain and agony. The kings of people, the rulers of the Arabs are dead. This is not true. After the battle of Badr finished, the Prophet وسلم, sent two of his men, Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Zayd ibn Haritha, may Allah be pleased with them, to the people of Medina, want to go to the top of Medina, want to go to the bottom of Medina, to bring them the good tidings that the battle of Badr was won by the Muslims. The Jews, when they saw Zayd ibn Haritha riding on Al-Qaswa, the camel of the Prophet ﷺ, who was known to be the adopted son of the Prophet, but not anymore, on his camel, so the minute the Jews saw this, they said, well, Muhammad has died in the Battle of Badr, and the evidence is that Zayd ibn Haritha is on his camel, and they were proven wrong by the grace of Allah. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we will be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims won the Battle of Badr, and after the Prophet ﷺ besieged the tribe of Bani Qaynuqa, the Jews, and he ordered them to leave, and he sent them to their exile in Sham, and they were Jews. One Jew who was so rich and powerful started to annoy the Muslims and disrespect the agreements between him and them. He was so frustrated when he learned that the leaders of Quraysh were killed 
were slayed on the battle of Badr. And he was outraged. The kings of the Arabs, the rulers of Quraysh, and for whom? For a bunch of, of Muslims, so-called Muslims? It was like a shock. It was a severe shock and blow to him, to the extent that he went in mourning to the people of Quraysh, giving his respects and sympathies, and trying to provoke them to come and fight and avenge the dead ones. And he was telling them that you had no right to lose. You shouldn't have lost. They are no one. They're farmers. They're a bunch of nothing. So they asked him a straight question. As a Jew, as a scholar of the books, the Old Testament, who's on the right path and track? Is it Muhammad and the Muslims? Or are we on the right path and track. Who is better at the side of Allah? Now, any fair and just person would tell them that those who worship one God, who worship Allah Azza wa Jal, are far greater than those who worship 360 idols. So you pagans by no means are close to him. Yet because of his arrogance, he said, no, of course, you are way better than he is. And that is why Allah revealed the verses of the Qur'an condemning his actions and condemning his false testimony that the pagans are better than the monotheists, are better than those who worship Allah alone. And when he went back to Medina, this was not the end of it. He started saying poetry, condemning Muslims, slandering them, ridiculing their religion. And also, he started saying love poems against the ladies of the Muslims, the wives of the companions, their daughters. And this was outrageous because, as you recall, poetry was the media. prevailing media tool at the time. So the Prophet said to his companions, this man's name was Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, the Jew. So he said to his companions, who would relieve me from his nuisance? Who would relieve Islam from his evil acts? So Muhammad ibn Maslama said, I'll do that with honor, Prophet of Allah. And he chose four other men with him. But he requested the Prophet والسلام, permission to say something that would, in other circumstances, be considered to be things that nullify a person's religion, person's belief in Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him this permission. This was an assassination attempt against this enemy of Islam. And before we go on, the normal question would be, is assassinating people acceptable in Islam? Well, generally, no. But this was not an assassination attempt. The Prophet ﷺ was not killing him for the sake of killing. He had to be executed. There's no doubt in that because he did not honor the agreements and he was slandering Islam and he was ridiculing the Quran and he was talking about the yes, yes. female companions of the Prophet ﷺ in a bad way. And you remember it's when it's you... It's like a state crime against... Excuse me? It's a state crime. Yes. Oh, no. And by itself, when someone talks bad about a woman, by talking bad we mean he accuses this woman of adultery. This is unacceptable in Islam. Any person who talks about a Muslim woman and says, I've seen her having sex with a man, or she is a prostitute, or she is this or that, which is an insult to her honor and dignity. If he does not bring forward four witnesses, he should be lashed yeah. 80 times for what he said. So if, if he brought only three witnesses, that's not enough. He has to bring four witnesses that seen the actual act. So this Kaab ibn Ashraf needed to be executed 
The Prophet could have easily والسلام, go there and executed him. But he did not want his fellow Jews to stand up, which would cause more bloodshed. He wanted the Prophet والسلام, to minimize the casualties, not from the Muslim side. We have the upper hand. But from their side, because he would be defended by his people, and lots of his people would die. They did not have a hand in what he did. It's his own responsibility. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Muhammad ibn Maslama. Muhammad ibn Maslama went to Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. And he said, Ka'b, you know me, I know you. We've been friends for so long. This man, he's a pain in the neck. He's been asking us to pay charity and sadaqah and zakat, poor do. We don't have money. All what he asks is for money and money, money. So Ka'b ibn Ashraf relaxed a little bit and said, well, you haven't seen nothing yet. There is more to come. This man is going to do this and that for you. So Muhammad ibn Maslama said, Ka'b, you're a rich man. Can you lend us some money? So he told him, yes, I can lend you some money, but what would you give me as a guarantee that you're going to pay me back? Or what we call as mortgage. So what's, what, what would it be? So it was like a trick or something? Yes, they yeah. wanted him to feel yeah. safe and secure. Yeah. So Muhammad ibn Maslam told him, what do you want as guarantee? So Ka'ab said, give me your women. Keep your women with me. And when you pay me back, I'll give you your women back. So Muhammad told him, are you crazy? You're one of the most handsome Arabs around. How would you want us to guarantee our wives and daughters with you? You will seduce them by no, no, no way, no other way. So he told them, okay, then keep your children, your kids, as a guarantee in my fortress. And... Muhammad al-Maslam said, I, again, this is unacceptable because our sons will be slandered till they die that they've been given as a guarantee for a dollar or two, for a dirham or a dinar. So this is an insult to them. So Ka'ab asked them, then what is your guarantee then? He told him, I think that the best guarantee for us is our armor and swords and, and knives. We're going to get you the weaponry, this would be as mortgage to us and to guarantee that we're going to pay you back. I actually heard uh, the tradition of Arabs is that if a man did not carry his weapon, he was considered foolish. So was this like, like, like this offering was like a big, as big as the deposit of the wives and, and the children? No, it, it wasn't at all because your weapon, you can buy them on the market. So... When they went to Ka'ab and told them that we will give you our weaponry, this was a security for him. And this was an, a trick from their side to come to him with full armor, wearing their swords and so that they can assassinate him, yes, and kill him on the spot. And they were justified to do so because we're bringing you your guarantee. <laughs> so he approved of that. And they went, they brought their armor and weapons, and they came at night. And he was a newlywed. So they called him from below his fortress. Ka'b ibn Ashraf. And he left the bed to go and answer them. His wife said, where are you going? It's the middle of the night. And I hear a voice with blood pouring down out of it. This woman was so smart. She recognized from the voice, from the tone of the voice, that this was not good. I don't, I don't feel it's, a, it's safe for you to go. He said, who are you talking about? This is Muhammad ibn Maslam, my brother. He's my buddy, he's my friend. And with him is Abu Na'ilah. He is my brother from suckling. So, and beside all of that, a brave boy like me, if he is invited to be stabbed at night, he would answer. This is something to be proud of. He was saying this out yeah. of arrogance. So he went down to them. They showed him the weapons, and he felt okay. So they talked for a while, you know, the Arabs, the poetry, and the bravery, and so on. And they said, why not take around, around the fortress, around your castle, 
just walk right here and there. So he agreed. While they were walking, they said, somebody took a smell and said, wow, what a nice smell. And immediately he was, you know, double in size. He said, yes, I just married one of the most beautiful women who wears the most beautiful perfumes of Arabia. So his brother said, can I smell it? So he gave him his head and he smelled his hair. And they walked for a while. And then, then he said, can I do that again? The smell is so beautiful. And he was happy, you know, being flattered by people. Mm -hmm. So he gave his head again. And they walked for a while. And the third time, he said, can I have a smell? He said, yeah, sure. So he put his hand in his hair and grabbed him really well. And all the four started stabbing him until he died. They went back to Medina. And from the outskirts of Medina, they cried saying, Allahu Akbar. The Prophet heard this and he was enjoying. He said, Allahu Akbar, your faces have succeeded. And they said, your face has succeeded, O Prophet of Allah. We managed to kill Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. And this was the end of this evil enemy of Islam. And this happened once or twice whenever the Prophet found people who did not honor their agreements with him and lots of chaos would be caused if an army went to them, he would send people to get rid of them because they deserve to be executed. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa